Hark! It's an 87th Precinct podcast. This is the only podcast in the world dedicated to Ed McBain's seminal series of police procedurals, which began in 1956 with Cop Hater and ended in 2005 with Fiddlers. There were 55 books in the series, and today's podcast looks at book number 39, Poison. My name's Paul Abbott, and to review this book, I'm joined as usual by Mr. Stephen Royston. Hello. And Mr. Morgan Brown. Hello there. We're still doing the podcast remotely, thanks to everyone's favourite global pandemic. Woo. So uh, anyway, we hope you're all doing all right wherever you are. If you want to get in touch, you can find us on everything if you just search for Hark87 Podcast, all the social media stuff, and you can say hello that way, as many of you do. We always appreciate it. But anyway, we're 39 books down, which means only 16 left to go. And... Um, we're off back to 1987 for this book, and the next book as well comes out in 1987. So for this episode, we'll catch up on what's been going on in 1986 to get us caught up to release date, if that's okay with everyone. It sounds very reasonable. Works for me. Cool. Well, I only picked some very quick world events from 1986, just a few quick ones to run down. As usual, when you you go doing a quick historical search for events in in any particular year, you just get bombarded with uh, misery and disaster, (laughs) or things that depress you later by reflecting on them. (laughs) Uh, But the 20th of January 1986, uh, the UK and France announced their plans for the Channel Tunnel. Oh, yeah. Which was a running joke for a long, long time, like it would never happen. But of course, it did just happen. Yep. And it's it's great. I went on it. In, well, actually, it was it was this year I went in the Channel Tunnel for the first time. You remember travelling? You remember going places? Way oh, back mean. in the day. Yeah. That was, in fact, back in January of this year that I went in it. January the 28th, and I do remember this clearly on the news, I'm sure you both will, uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Oh, yes. Uh, I do remember that very vividly, yeah. Yeah, because when you're a a little kid, obviously space stuff's really exciting and there's all this stuff about launching and and, and then, yeah. I remember that being the first time. It's like, oh, yeah, human beings in this. And just, yeah, even now it makes me feel very strange thinking about it. But we move on from that. Because in March the 3rd, and this is for our Australian listeners here, because I know we have some. In, on March the 3rd of 1986, the Australia Act comes into effect. Do you know anything about the Australia Act? I don't think I do. <sighs> I don't know. No. Well, it was what gave Australia its own legal independence from the UK. Oh, crikey. So I... I didn't realise that was when that happened, but yeah, that was when they stopped having to follow our parliamentary system. Or something like that, anyway. Hmm. May the 25th, this is something I've I've heard about a lot, but I never knew anything about. There's a thing called Hands Across America. Hams. Not hams, hands. As um, it, as referenced in, um, I don't know if you've seen uh, Us, the Jordan Peele movie. No, I haven't. Ah, right. It, it, it's 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 an important part of that. I think it also oh, right. crops up in an episode of The Simpsons as well. Yeah, I think that's where I, f- I first <laughs> came across the reference to it in in an episode of The Simpsons. But that was a, a public fundraising event, and mm. it was like nearly or so about six million people in America held hands for fifteen minutes in an attempt to go to. F- well, it was supposed to be forming a human chain across the entire length of the states, wasn't it? Yeah, that's width, idea. width, not length. Which is actually physically impossible to do because of because <laughs> it's such a big country with huge open spaces. Yeah. Yeah. So, but they raised fifteen million dollars holding hands, so that's not too bad, is it? Fair play to them. I think hams across America would have been more <laughs> successful and tastier. Uh, yeah, and more memorable all these years. <laughs> and when we got sixty million hams all lined up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's sort of what they try to do every Thanksgiving, isn't it? You know, <laughs> every you're never more than four foot from a ham at Thanksgiving. Oh, anyway, yeah. hamsters across America. Blimey! Oh, well, I suppose they they breed fairly prodigiously. It's possible. You need a lot of them. You would you need would. a lot of them. 
well, let's move on from that concept to nothing happens then until October the 29th when UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher <laughs> officially opens the M25 motorway. Oof. Oh. About which you can make similar disgusted noises, I think. Like a, like a good in- infrastructure programme. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realise it was well that late, really, that someone had the idea of putting a big motorway around London. Well, yes, it, it was going to be one of three uh, concentric motorways around London. They only ever built one of them, and that's why it's hideously busy all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not pleasant being stuck on the M25 motorway. It's a... Yeah, it's an experience we've all had at some point mm-hmm. in our lives, I'm sure. Usually when you're trying to get somewhere quickly, like to a gig or a show or something yeah. like that. Um, anyway, now I've got a date unknown one, so I can't tell you the exact date for this, but I do know it's 1986. The place is Lee on the Solent, Gosport in the UK. That's going to sound like that's such a mad name to anyone who mm-hmm. doesn't know what place names are like in the UK. <laughs> and it is the opening of the Hovercraft Museum. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I was thinking what could be in there, yeah, but, yeah, is it still open? It is still open. Oh, great stuff. Should, should go? We'll have a road trip there when we're allowed to. We'll mm. go and en well, masse to the Hovercraft Museum. Should go on the Hovercraft, really. But... Yeah, round the edge of the country, up the solar. It'd be difficult parking in the car park if you're in a Hovercraft, though, because you just keep <laughs> hovering around. Yeah, everything um, have to be tethered. Yeah, presumably there'd be, like, staff <laughs> on hand to... The shepherd, the hovercraft, yeah, rope you in. <laughs> cool. Anyway, that's 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 stuff that happened in 1986. But what I should also mention, of course, in 1986, it happens on the 15th of October, is Evan Hunter, Ed McBain, turns 60 years old. Mm. So he's pretty much the grand old man of crime fiction by this point, despite looking very youthful as far as contemporary photos and video goes, yeah. such as the video of him on Wogan. <laughs> oh, the chat show. I, I, I saw you issue a photo out earlier. It looked, it looked very Wogan. Yeah, that was from the <laughs> yeah. Wogan appearance. He was he was wearing a Richie Benno blazer. I thought there, like the <laughs> off white, the white, the ivory, or the beige. Yes, it was a, a, a light suit against a pastel pink backdrop. Yeah, uh, or he's being into. And we, I've mentioned him being on Wogan before because he's. He appears on there. There doesn't seem to be any extensive, ostensibly be any reason why he's actually on Wogan, which is a very popular chat show in the UK. Very good chat show. Wogan isn't even hosting it, Terry Wogan. It's it's Anna Ford. But he comes on and he has, and she talks to him and he doesn't mention a book or anything. <laughs> but it's odd because he had two novels out, not 87th Precinct things in 1986, which presumably is why he's off doing, you know, shows like Wogan, because this is, yeah... But he goes on just after Kenneth Williams. That's what I mentioned earlier in, in a much, much earlier podcast. Yeah, it's funny because like Wogan was very much like top division guests, wasn't it? You know, like really yeah. famous people plugging this, that and the other. So for him to be on and not plug anything is fairly strange, really. It is. And it's strange that he's on after Kenneth Williams, who was on Wogan a lot. He's, he's sandwiched between Kenneth Williams and um, and the House Martins. Fantastic. <laughs> doing a happy hour their their song so it's it's a very strange thing i in terms of what he's asked about anna ford asks asks him about it's how true to life are cop shows she mentions hill street blues and he pulls a face (laughs) using the phrase it's somewhat derivative (laughs) yeah she talks to him about how dangerous new york is as a real place and uh, and whether he's been to Italy that you know followed up on his Italian background it's a, oh. it's a strange thing that he doesn't mention <laughs> anything that's out that year really so uh, I bet his publishers were delighted yeah yeah he was probably just there eyeing up uh, Anna Ford uh, you'd imagine yeah. so yeah yeah you'd have thought so <laughs> so that's some this so yeah all sorts going on for McBain in 86 and I'll give you the rest of the the McBain 86 rundown and that is that in 1986, Cinderella comes out, which is a Matthew Hope novel. We have Another Part of the City, which is a standalone crime novel. There's a short story called Honesty, published in The New Black Mask. And I'll talk about the 1987 stuff when we do the next book. But that's, you know, it's not like he's not been doing anything, because he's also written an entire TV series called Dream West, which is based on a novel by a guy called David Nevin. It's 
three episodes, which runs to 420 minutes of television. <laughs> That's a long mini series, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's been the screenwriter for that. It's based on this novel about this real life 19th century explorer politician called John C. Fremont or Fremont, who was the first Republican nominee for president in 1856. And he was one of these guys who led pathfinding expeditions into the the Western U S and made loads of money in the, in the gold rush. Crikey. And he also lost loads of money on the Pacific railroad and died destitute in New York in the 1880s. So did this thing ever get commissioned then? So it was, it was on TV. Yeah. It was shown on CBS. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it starred Richard Chamberlain as Fremont himself. Of course it did. Absolutely course it did. Richard Chamberlain be nailed on for something like that. Yeah, in 1986 particularly. F. Murray Abraham as President Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Unsurprisingly. And also, you've got Jerry Orbach in it, who appeared as a junior gang member in the film of Cop Hater in 1958. Brilliant. And Rip, and Rip Torn as well is in it. It's always good value for money. Definitely. So he's been busy, let's say. He's, but he's still found time to come over to the UK and meet Anna Ford on the on Wogan. In Richie Benno's suit. In Richie Benno's <laughs> suit. Yeah. So we come to Poison Itself, published in Arbor House and Avon for the paperback in America. It's still in Hamish Hamilton and Pan in the UK. But yeah, it comes out in February of 1987. First impressions. Not that these are first impressions. Presumably we've all read it before. But uh, actually, that's a good question. Have we all read it before? Uh, I, I've i indeed, yes. I, I hadn't the first time for me, actually. Oh, right. oh, right. Okay. So first impressions definitely from, from Morgan. Uh, have you got a general thought on it, Morgan? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, interesting to see Hal Willis uh, sort of take in centre stage because he's been around for a long time, but he's he's not really kind of featured that heavily. And I think it's, it's sort of the, the point where he really starts to become much more of a kind of significant character in the series, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, he's been in more or less since the start, but he's never had a, a fully featured starring role hmm. despite his being involved in a few quite interesting bits and pieces along the way. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the start of Hal Willis's uh, being a bit more of a character in the front line of the stories yeah. from from here on in anyway. Because yeah, he has quite a run of it in this book, any, <laughs> any road. Yeah, I seem to remember he has a few in a row now, doesn't he? Where he's like the main actor, as it were, character. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because he, he's fairly significant in a few, a few of the earlier ones, isn't he? Yeah, hmm. he never really has a, a full A plot where he runs all the way through. I don't think at any point, but like, you know, he's out on the... He's in the park in Fuzz, isn't he? Where he's hmm. the guy in the sleeping bag with Eileen Burke and stuff like that. So he gets a few good moments like that in the past. But now he's becoming a bit more than just the short guy on the squad. Yeah. The guy who knows judo. That's it, yeah. (laughs) He's decided to give him uh, some other traits as well. (laughs) It's a bit of a funny one, this book, I think, Mm. because it's my theory is that it's not entirely an 87th Precinct book, which I think I've probably said once or twice before, but I'm sure I'll be able to try and explain that as we go along. But we should mention the dedication before we get stuck into it, because it's dedicated to Stanley Matchenberg, who was... It turns out from Sarasota, Florida, he was a dentist <laughs> and it was a mate of, of Evan Hunter's because he's also mentioned in the dedication to the book Goldilocks as part of the Tuesday night players. Uh-huh. So so I don't know what McBain's Tuesday night players were, perhaps, you know, like a group playing cards or something like that. And mm-hmm. But yeah, so he's dedicated this to his friend who is a dentist, which is Lovely. interesting. <laughs> So who wants to give us an overview of what happens in this then? Well, yes, I suppose I can um, have, a, uh, have a have a go, I suppose. Uh, the, yeah, the, I suppose the, the thing to mention up front and probably alluding to what you mentioned then about whether it's strictly perhaps a 100% an 87th Precinct novel in its kind of inception really is it involves a hell of a lot of narrative about one of the the main characters in it, which 
not wishing to ruin things from the outset. So, <laughs> but who is neither the victim, neither a victim nor nor the uh, perpetrator. It's just like one of the the character from which all the action kind of is linked, really, which which is quite unusual, I would say. Also, a lot of action taking place far outside of the city, which is again pretty unusual, I think. Yeah, and in and in the past, really. So that's, that's quite right, a, yeah. a, a a bit of an oddity, really. But yes, as the title suggests, it kicks off with a good old poisoning um, in a fairly grimy crime scene with um, Monaghan and Monroe, of course, and Hal Willis is at, attends with uh, Corella, and they're pretty much just the two sole detectives really the others crop up every now and then and a little bit later on with a bit of a stakeout but um primarily them um and the scrambling around for motive really they don't really know they're not quite sure what's gone on and they, i think they get the diary don't they and track do a bit of classic um investigation yeah. and paper chase stuff. yeah and just trying to track down people who this fella knew and trying to uh, take it from there really and that gets them on to a lady called marilyn hollis is it that's, that's it right was it the, the the redial button on the telephone or something that brings them to it? ah yes it does yes yeah yeah but she features in the diary as well but yeah the, exactly. yeah a bit of classic colombo modern technology yeah. kind of <laughs> yeah yeah they get onto her straight away because they press the redial button on her f- on his phone there's just a bit of a let's see we last spoke to and it's her and it turns out it's a, a lady friend of his and she is essentially the central character to the entire novel. So, yes, yeah. rather than me wittering on about absolutely everything, I suppose that gets <laughs> us a good way into the book, doesn't it? No, it gets us going. I, certainly the stuff about the, the redial telephone answering machine thing, whatever it is, is interesting because, uh, yeah, they reach an, an, her answering machine and they use this redial function by taking this phone and sticking it inside uh, the clerical office in the squad room and just getting someone to just constantly press redial <laughs> until someone answers, which is the start of everything there. But yeah, very much like a Colum- one of the Columbo episodes where it's like, ah, well, here's a new bit of technology that's been used in some way or other. There's quite a lot of forensics in this, isn't there? But generally, given the poisoning, obviously you get a lot of that fairly naturally, I suppose. But you get a lot of explanation as to what the telephone company can and can't do in terms of tracing calls and the lab and there's quite yeah. a lot of classic 87th like explanations of this that and the other all the way through it really which uh, which is it's quite rich in that sense i would say yeah although it is missing certain 87th precinct aspects in terms of the procedural stuff you're absolutely right it does that quite intensely throughout mm. Because so much of it is, you know, there's like eight pages of diary photo stats in here. Yeah, yeah, which are provided if you're willing to. They're a, they're a fantastic clue if you're willing to go through them. But it does miss a lot of, I think, the broader stuff. The city doesn't feature much as a character. The mm-hmm. weather's barely alluded to. Yeah, I'm not sure about the city actually. The, the weather may be, but the, the city, I th- there's like a really long deep explanation about like the geography of the city at one point isn't there this you know what, this road um, yeah. leads to there and then this is west of that and i think if you were producing one of your maps you know this, this that that would be a very uh useful passage to yeah I, I am uh yeah i'll go back on that a little bit it, it's not quite in in depth it's covering a bit of the ground again of the ethnic makeup of the city and how it's mm. changed and, and how certain parts of it are like where all the big companies go and it's this that and the other avenue j basically around there triggers it so yeah it, it's useful stuff they also yeah. mentioned the old seawall loads which i can't recall ever being mentioned before but perhaps, <laughs> perhaps yeah, I, just I think it's, yeah it's obviously a part of the city because it's a, it's a kind of equivalent of where where that is in new york mm. so it must exist yeah because it's an island so otherwise it just the end would be all tatty and the waves would get in <laughs> and there's not much in the way of zany humor but there is one the only other sort of 
B plot is like a, a one scene thing with a guy who's arrested after shooting someone in a cinema. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he pretty much always throws in somebody like that, doesn't he? It's, yeah, just a little aside for no reason whatsoever. It doesn't really reflect anything or state anything or enhance anything, I don't think. It's just another something else is happening in the police station at this time yeah, type the, of thing. because he shoots this woman behind him because she's talking during the film and then he, he says, have you got any regrets or something? And he says, yes, I wish I'd done it earlier and then I could have watched more of the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we better talk about Marilyn Hollis because she is the main feature here. And as we mentioned, this Hal Willis is the big character here and he gets involved with Marilyn Hollis, who is essentially the prime suspect for most of this. Definitely fairly reasonably soon into the book, I suppose we should add, that a second of her male friends gets killed because she she basically has got three gentleman friends, hasn't she? Which are all quite different. A bohemian painter. There's the murdered guy who's a kind of up and coming kind of salesman, whether he's quite a yuppie or not, I don't know, but that kind of an yeah. upward striver and then and then an accountant and then a a lawyer, is that right? So yeah. fairly different types of individuals. Yeah, she's not sort of messing around with people in low-life bars or anything like this. This is what you'd, I suppose you'd call upper-middle class because she herself appears to be independently wealthy and living in a quite a posh place yeah. as well. I mean, I'll, I'll throw over to Morgan. What did you make of, of Marilyn Hollis and how, uh, well, her as a character? Yeah, she's an interesting one, isn't she? I, I, I guess it's one of these things where there's constant um, little revelations about her cropping up every few pages, aren't there, really, almost? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She she does kind of dominate the whole the whole book, and, um, yeah, the sort of picture of her gets more and more kind of outlandish as we go along. It's it's an odd one. Quite early on, like, Hal Willis kind of falls through. She, 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 worth adding, she, she doesn't see any of these... Uh, friends of hers behind their backs do, do they they all kind of know not necessarily the names of the others but she, she knows that she's got plenty of male friends yeah. as far as she's yeah. concerned they're all sort of uh, modern people who understand that they've got this this open um, open relationship where, yeah absolutely yeah but she's quite an interesting character in terms of how becomes the mechanism for her story revealed and like mm-hmm. every single chapter is like right have you told me absolutely everything now yes and then there'll be some yeah. other revelation it's like well well i didn't tell you that because <laughs> you would be upset but this is now the truth and okay. then a few chapters later well actually there's a bit more to it than that and just bit by bit her kind of backstory gets revealed to the point that reasonably close to the end there's entire chapters isn't there almost just kind of moving you totally back in time and to other countries to explain exactly what happened with her life yeah so i think this is this is basically we're getting into the territory of mega spoilers for the book but you know <laughs> if anyone's listening to this podcast then they know that that's the case because this is a character who wouldn't have revealed her story to Hal Willis necessarily if it hadn't been for the fact that she remains this suspect. And every time something happens, he has to go to her and say, well, why? What What about you? What's the truth? And she has to reveal a little bit more to try and explain herself so she doesn't seem like a complete weirdo to him. Finally, it pulls out of her this insane story. Yeah. Well, she, she starts... It- Fairly early on, she she claims she's got this very posh apartment through her stepdad, who's um, a wealthy oh, oilman, yeah. and then that turns out to be incorrect. But they also find out that she took a um, a fall for prostitution, I think, in in Houston, yeah. which she fesses up to, and then and then her like horrific revelation as it's framed in the book at the time is she was a prostitute for a, a long time in South America, which, you know, Hal's kind of shocked about and the, the vast amount of money that she's claims to have saved up shows how uh, successful that was over quite a long period of time, which, you know, obviously the book kind of plays on, but then mm-hmm. 
even that is shown to be she's kind of she creates one bad story to hide <laughs> i don't think it's even yeah. worse just kind of a, a different history yeah. isn't it that she's trying to trying to hide with this you know thing that she hopes is so shocking he will just believe if you see what i mean yeah. but even that turns out to be not correct yeah, and this is where my argument about this not necessarily being a, a fully fledged eighty seventh precinct novel is: is it feels like her story that she's telling is something that McBain might have had in his head for a standalone novel yeah. about someone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and he's perhaps not been able to write it, and has in in the end grabbed it, squeezed it down, and stuck it into this book, which yeah. makes for an interesting character. Yeah, yeah, no, it it certainly does. Yeah, and it, but yeah, the 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 amount of words essentially she gets in this book is quite you know over and above what main central characters get in 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 the other in in the other books certainly definitely it does feel like a bit of a novella within the novel and it is it's horrifying stuff i mean the thing it reminded me of in a strange way is breaking bad the way a bad situation has happened that she's got herself into and it's escalated and escalated and escalated. And before you know it, you're reading this stuff or watching this stuff as with these TV series. And you're just thinking, how have I got here? This is so absolutely awful. What happens to this character has happened to her in her past. And you just, it's, ugh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty grueling. I don't suppose we need to explain everything, but uh, yeah, it, it's essentially, she kind of escapes uh, the US, doesn't she, to try and escape her pimp in Houston and then yeah. ends up getting arrested in Mexico for a fairly minor... Yeah, drug drugs offence. But yet serious drugs, you know, a fairly foolish thing that she did, trying to go through the border with some marijuana still, and then ends up in some horrific kind of Midnight Express kind of jail in Mexico... Yeah, which is a fairly horrific passages in the book, and then from there ends up being essentially sold under duress to some fella in Argentina. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a character study, it's it's horrific, and she's she's totally I mean, trapped in this. Yeah, she doesn't have a passport, does she? No. And I mean, we won't mention how she gets away because it may crop up in future things. Yeah, but, but it's it's sort of incredible and horrifying and it's, it's a very interesting bit of writing, but like I say, I think it's something he's had from somewhere else and he's shoved it in there. Yeah. Hmm. You wonder, wonder whether, where he's got his inspiration from that because it, it's such a kind of yeah. odd and fairly graphic story that you wonder whether he's hmm. kind of read it somewhere. Cause it, I suppose it's worth mentioning that the, the, uh, this Marilyn, this all happened when she was like in her teens, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, but a lot of that ends up being reasonably incidental to the actual crime. Yeah. That's true. It, it, it all seems like it might be massively significant to the crime at hand, and then actually, in the end, maybe not so much. No. Yeah, you give her give her a big crime background, you expect something to have emerged out of that, and you expect Hal Willis listening to this story to go, oh, I see, yes, that must mean this, that, and the other, you're being pursued or whatever. Yeah, but. Yeah, because you just wonder whether there's some gunman from Argentina who's suddenly doing all the poisoning. But instead we get what I also consider to be a quick fix plot solution. Somewhat, yeah. It's worth mentioning that two other of the boyfriends die. So um, it's not just the first. Although by different means, two of them die by poisoning and one is stabbed. Yeah, nicotine poisoning as well, which... uh, Sounds horrible. ...goes in great lengths as to how that manifests itself and how you can poison somebody with uh, nicotine and there's all the business about the distiller. If any readers fancy poisoning someone with nicotine, there's lengthy uh, explanations of different (laughs) ways you can do that. So it's always good to know. Yeah, including an advert for the Gadgia electric distiller machine, which yes. it turns out was a real thing as well. Yeah. I looked it up and found that thing. You, you can buy them online now on eBay. Tremendous. So, yeah, so there's there's quite a lot of that in the book. I like that. I wonder if McBain was trying to give up smoking himself at this time because there's a lot of, you know, there's still this talk of nicotine and he makes Maya Maya be 
is getting harassed about smoking as well in the book. Yeah, so I suppose the mid to late eighties was the time when that was really the, like the anti-smoking kind of lobby would be getting into its stride by then, wouldn't it? So, well, yeah. yeah, and it's also something that's going to haunt McBain himself in future years, Quite. which we will get to when it becomes sadly relevant. But yeah, I will just mention some real world references I spotted in here. So Willis constantly talks about this, describes Marilyn as pale horse, pale rider, which is a reference to Revelation 6, chapters 1 to 8, which is actually used in a collection of stories by someone called Catherine Porter, which was published in 1939. Mm. There's some references to films and TV, such as Miami Vice is referred to in terms of how Parker's dressed at one point. Oh, yeah. 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 There's a reference to Marathon Man, the film, because yeah. of uh, the dentist reference. There's a reference to a new chief of detectives, and there was a new chief of detectives in the NYPD in 1986, I think it was, which was Robert Colangelo, became the new chief of detectives. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is a throw forward, but Willis and Marilyn get stoned together, and it drives Hal Willis bonkers. He starts reciting Jabberwocky, the oh, poem, yeah. which, of course, becomes... Something in a later book. <laughs> it certainly which, does. Oh, and a reference to the French connection as well. There in in there as well. Oh yeah, yeah remember that. So, so yeah, we better talk about how this all wraps up though in the end, because the thing that McBain lets himself down here for me is that he he ends it with a mechanism that he's already used in a different book, and he even mentions it in the book. Uh, what what do you mean mechanism? Well, the way that this guy killed one of his victims. And what happened in the story, 80 million eyes. Oh, yes, he does, yeah. Well, oh, just the, the the delay aspect, yeah. 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 It's not really that necessary either, because surely he could have just planted the poison in some liquor or something, just the same way he did the other guy. If yeah. He wasn't, yeah. If he wasn't that desperate at what time. It seems an overly elaborate way to have killed him. It really when, does, Yeah. When he clearly is prepared to just turn up at the next guy's with his scalpel and stick some nicotine in the booze at the third guy. So, yeah, yeah, it is a little bit. But you get lots of dental charts. I like the way that it's complicated, but the plot, it seems totally pointless. (laughs) Yeah, I know what you mean. It would have been better keeping that his powder dry on that and using that in a plot where... You know, Columbo style, it, it was necessary that he died at a certain point in time, but there wasn't any need for it here. Yeah, because he's already, he's already done it in 80 million eyes, <laughs> and he mentions that in this book. <laughs> yeah, and the perpetrator as well. I don't know, it struck me as a totally alarm bells were ringing, just thinking, why on earth is Corella talking to a dentist so early in this book? And then he just disappears. Because yeah. I couldn't quite remember who'd done it. And then as soon as he popped up, <laughs> and then he went away again, and then like a chapter on, you're thinking, it's the bloody dentist, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, the resolution is a slight, yeah, a bit disappointing. But with this, more than perhaps other other time uh, books... It kind of doesn't. I didn't f- felt felt it matters as much because you kind of get more bought into like her story uh, carries a lot more of the weight really than necessary the yeah, the, true, the murder resolution as it were. Yeah. So, what do you think about the perpetrator Morgan? How did it? Did you figure it out as you read it through the first time? Um, well, I had my suspicions. I, I wouldn't say I necessarily figured it out, but um, yeah, he did seem like a, a fairly sort of obvious suspected that there probably wasn't that much reason to have that sort of lengthy chat yeah. with him that early sort of early on otherwise um i wonder if mcbain dedicating the novel to his dentist friend is kind of like a bit of a, a, a macabre kind of nod to who the perpetrator is in in this novel i think almost certainly it must <laughs> it must be because it, it's all based on on uh, dental stuff yeah so i bet you he basically went my mate's a dentist i'll, I'll quiz him about things he can do he's yeah. probably had that exact conversation about dentists getting a bad rap as a result of marathon man with with his his friend hasn't he and that's why that's in there i guess yeah. 
um, undoubtedly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure it must be. And it's, yeah, and even the summing up, which is we, we see more and more now, just done in the Q and A format. Mm. It's quite a short one in this this book, and. The way he sort of demonstrates the madness of this person willing to kill all these people just because he fancied someone, essentially. That's a spoiler going by there. Mm. It's, it's basically, he it's, it's owns up to everything and then just basically goes, oh, can I listen back to it, please? Yeah. Like, that's how you know this guy is a loony. <laughs> yep. Technical term. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Right, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Before we give our summing up for this ourselves, I'll give you some of the contemporary reviews of the time. Oh, and yeah. We'll see if our, our opinions agree with theirs, really, as we go along here. Let's have a look. So in the New York Times, who haven't been covering his books for a little while, it seems, but we've got a new reviewer called John Gross, who reviews it in 1987, says, as usual with the 87th Precinct series, the investigation snakes its way to an exciting and unexpected conclusion. And he says, and as usual, I'm left with the feeling that there are really two mysteries, the story itself and the mystery of why Mr. McBain should be as good as he is. <laughs> and it, he's basically saying, well, he writes to a formula, but how come he is so good writing to a formula? And then he posits that he maintains a cunning balance between authenticity and artifice. Hmm. But... High though the general standard is, some of the 87th Precinct books are inevitably better than others. Poison belongs halfway down the list, he says. Mm. So he's presumably got his own Kenneth system. Hey, <laughs> well, he, he certainly sounds like somebody who's read quite a lot of them, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, a lot of people did read a lot of them. So <laughs> yeah. who else have we got? Uh, Gene M. White, who by now must be the longest running continuous reviewer of 87th Precinct stories we've had in these sections, yes. says... McBain is a mesmerising storyteller and you are carried to the smashing finale. Uh, the flashbacks are a bit awkward. Well, yeah, mm. disgusting really is, is the thing, but they're supposed to be. But there is the stunningly ingenious means of murder, which it would be unfair to reveal. Oh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, so that's one that Gene M. White seems to have liked more than many. We've also got John Coleman in the Sunday Times. Awkward for the 87th Precinct when de Detective... Car Detective? I knew he was going to say that. When Detective Carella's partner, Hal Willis, falls for millionaire Marilyn, one of whose numerous bed friends has met death by nicotine poisoning. McBain uses his printed charts and diary entries quite magisterially for the brilliant <laughs> solution. That's very grand, isn't it? isn't it? But he finishes it off with this sentence. He says, he rarely nods. Whereas it's also reviewed in The Times itself by Marcel Berlins, who says, even his second division tales are better than most crime writers can ever attain. Detective Willis of the 87th implausibly goes moody for a prostitute whose friends are being bumped off. Taut mystery compensates for unlikely emotions. So we, we better sum this up here. And I've got some bonus McBain to, to mention before we finish as well. Morgan, I'm going to have to come to you as, a, as the first time reader of this. To give me your overview and score. Yeah, I don't know. It's a funny one, isn't it? I, I, I mean, it was very enjoyable. I absolutely flew through it, enjoyed it all the way. I don't know. It's it's not quite top tier for me, as as you say. I think that the the actual sort of mystery element kind of gets a bit lost um, behind Marilyn's story, and you know that that bit is certainly kind of interesting in its kind of harrowing way. But I kind of prefer it when we can just sort of focus a bit more on the actual mystery at hand. That said, there's there's still a lot to enjoy. I, I'm going to go for um, a score of 68 police shields on this one. 68. Okay, Steve-O. Yeah, I suppose I'd echo quite a lot of that. I, yeah, I, I did very much enjoy it, though, and I suppose one's score ref reflects that, really. I, I think there's, even though... Her story does take up quite a lot chunk of the book. What he does devote to the 87th, I think, is fairly densely populated with meaty procedure and forensics and a lot of the usual tropes of the series. So, yeah, I, th I think I would nudge it into the the upper echelons just about. So I, I think I would be maybe at, say, 80... Well, I go eighty-seven. Why not eighty-seven Oof. for eighty-seventh? Bloody hell! Got a bit of a spread going on. Excellent. Yeah. Well, 
I'm certainly not going to go that high. I'm not going to go as high as Morgan's either because I, it is compelling. But like Marilyn's story in this is is like a proper page turner, which is why I get the feeling it's like you know was he wanting to make this into a separate novel? Was that what it where it came from? But I just found the ending, the actual mechanism. There's a thing in mysteries where you've got a load of characters and you talk to them in turn and you present them in different situations, give them means, motive, opportunity, whatever bits of it you need to. But there's almost in this some of the not so successful ones, you have that incidental character who you're supposed to sort of go, oh, yeah, they were the butler or they delivered the, the hams. <laughs> you know, someone who was there briefly. And then at the end, it's like, aha, it was actually ham delivered that did it. Or, <laughs> And this is a bit like that because the dentist is like there and then gone. And then mm. so I don't know. But I think it's just, it, to me, it's a six out of 10. So it's going for 60 for me for 60 police shields, which gives us a score of, and we round down. Do we round down or round up? I can't even remember well, anymore. Round, Imagine what way you're not supposed to do it. <laughs> I'm rounding down. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's seventy-one police shields. So mm. that places it in the sort of killer's choice, hail to the chief sort of bracket. Yeah. On our, I think seven out of ten's fair enough for that. Yeah. It's a bit atypical, really, but um... but we say that so often, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> Before we wrap up this, I did want to mention, I've read another Evan Hunter book mm. called The Paper Dragon, which I've had on my shelf for ages because looking at it, because it's 600 pages long. <laughs> so Paper Dragon came out in 1966 and I wanted to mention it because it's very interesting. Uh, it's all about a court case between a book and a play. And the book's called the the book in the book is called the Paper Dragon, and it's a plagiarism case that plays out, and it's all about the characters involved in this plagiarism case, where someone's saying, "Well, I wrote a play ages ago. You wrote a book where I reckon you stole it, and they made a film, and so I'm suing you for royalties, plagiarism." Now, of course, what I couldn't find anywhere in the contemporary reviews or anyone mentioning since, it's just another bit of Evan Hunter's life. <laughs> It is, so let me read something from the biography of Evan Hunter I've been writing. I'll just read a little bit here. I won't read all of it. It could be for ages. In February of 1962, Hunter found himself alongside MGM Pictures, Simon & Schuster and Pocket Books, named as defendant in a court case brought by the writers Morris Burnett and Frederick Stefani, who alleged that their stage play Shadows later rewritten as Hickory Stick, was plagiarised by MGM for their movie and by implication by Hunter in his original book, The Blackboard Jungle. Yeah. So, the case had actually started in 1958 because these playwriters sued MGM. MGM then went, oh, hang on, if we lose, we better sue the people who put the book out because they would have published the plagiarised thing. So they sued, they cross-claimed against Simon and Schuster, who then cross-claimed with MGM against Evan Hunter. Oh, God. So, and this all ended up in this plagiarism case, of which the report is published in April of 1962. The short story is, basically, the case was dismissed in favour of the defendants. <laughs> The, the judge basically said that a careful comparison of the works leads only to the conclusion that the claimed significant similarities are either non-existent, trivial, or non-copyrightable. They are product of the plaintiff's misguided zeal. <laughs> and this book, The Paper Dragon, I can't believe is never mentioned anywhere that this is just basically that story, but with different names, different settings. Although what he's done is he's made the playwright basically have his history's personal background so there's a bit of like autobiography snuck away in the paper dragon in here as well. So what what I can say for a book about a court case about plagiarism, which ends with a load of reproduction of the judge's findings, mm. which is almost word for word from the real world. It's not a bad book at all. Yeah. It's it's really quite enjoyable for 600 pages. <laughs> well, so there you go. If anyone could make that readable, I'm sure it's Evan Hunter. Yeah, it definitely, definitely. So that's that then. That is Poison from the start of 1987. We will be back in our next episode to talk about the next book from 1987, which is Tricks. And so until then, I'm going to say goodbye, as is Steve-O. Goodbye. And Morgan. Fairly well. <laughs> <laughs>